dictionary, and somebody took a picture of me and they wrote under my name, Dictionary Dorks, and they put that on the form, only because I told them I always took the dictionary with me, even when we went on vacation. Well, then in the cash, it came up that everybody had dictionaries, and they took them with them at all times. So, you know, I'm not sure why they need them. But I promise not to make fun of you. And I have this fabulous notebook with a nice leather cover that I've never used. It has lots of pages, and I'm afraid that I might, I just might not do it justice. So I've never used it. I keep it wrapped up, and it will probably stay that way. My 3 by 5 it's just something I can manage. They're cheap. I can rip out a page, I guess, if I want to. Uh, some of my hiking ones I should have brought because when I hike, they got wet, and so they're these big bloated things. But, I don't know. To me, my 3 by 5s are probably my most valuable possession. As Albert Einstein says, I never remember anything I can't write down. That's why you always have it. And what are you going to write down? I don't want you to be lazy. I want you to record your reactions. Not only did you see 22 geese, but maybe you, or 22 goslings, but maybe you had some type of reaction about it. Maybe it triggered something. I want you to record the details. Maybe one of the goslings had red feathers instead of the yellow ones, so you'd write that down. It just, it's anything that catches your eye. I want you to think of your notebook as your pocket. You're picking up all these little nuggets of information and you're sticking them in here because you're going to be using them later. And as Mary Oliver, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet says, for at least 30 years and at almost all times, I have carried a notebook with me in my back pocket, small, three inches by five, and hand sewn. By no means do I write poems in these notebooks, and yet over the years, the notebooks have been laced with phrases that eventually appear in poems. So they are the pages upon which I begin. It's just not me. This isn't a new thing. And as Natalie Goldberg says, every time you sit down, don't expect something great to happen. Practice is like stretching before a run. Sometimes you're going to go out there and you might just have your observation of where you are and just a few notes of what you are seeing, and that might be it. And other times, things are just going to hit you, and you'll just fill your notebook with glorious phrases. It's just a matter of time. And in here, you can probably say, Sue, you know, when I say, okay, we need to write a five-minute thing, you'll probably say, it just didn't happen for me this time. I'll maybe buy that one time, and then that's it. <laughs> so I do respect participation. And as also, as Michael and I like to say, one thought is an observation. Two observations are a trend. Three observations are data. Just think, if you go to the same place over and over, season after season, the information that you are going to generate. I'm a field biologist, and when I go to my field plots, you know, I'm looking around and my boss said, Sue, why do your notes say that there was this and this blooming, you saw five stink bugs, you just didn't put that the garlic mustard was in seed stage and that you saw so many plants. I said, because you never know how you're going to use that information. We might be able to glean something out of it that we didn't know. So uh, I just can't stress how important your observations are. And you're in a fabulous area that's going to be totally evolving. I love reading Jane's blog because it's like I can't get here enough and yet Jane writes these wonderful entries about what's coming on. So I really appreciate that. I do read them. And as Edward Abbey says, in recording my observations of the natural scene, I have striven above all for accuracy since I believe that there is a kind of poetry, even a kind of truth in a simple fact. Those are your observations, these simple facts. How do you get started? The dreaded blank page. <laughs> Remember, I have this that I don't want to mess up. But these are small, so you know we can, you know, we can just begin. That's what I like about them. The first thing I always put where I am. This was one from Tennessee, so I was at Angel Falls. I was by Big South Fork. Here's the date. 
On my notebooks, usually, this one I didn't, but usually I have the year so that I just don't have to keep writing the year. It's also a good idea to put a name address label in your notebook in case you leave it somewhere or in case you might lose it. Maybe someone would be kind to send it back to you. And then I just start writing things. We talked to the ranger and they said it had been one of the driest it had been in many years. I wrote that. And then I just start listing things. I have kind of big handwriting because I usually walk and write at the same time. Again, just more lists, more lists here. I make a little observation. I'm waiting to take a picture. To me, this is going to be the most beautiful picture on earth. And but I'm waiting for the sun to go in. So I talk about that. And I fill like five or six pages of my notebook just like that. So it's really pretty easy. To summarize your three by five, think of it as your bank account. This is where you're storing all that valuable information. You don't care how it's organized, how your handwriting looks like. I think of mine as like the junk drawer. Everything is in there because someday I'm going to need it at some time. It's a scrapbook in which my artifacts are words. My 3x5 notebook breaks down writing into moments I can manage. And as Pete Dinn says, there is no right way and no wrong way to maintain a journal. There is only your way. Do you put time of day much? Sometimes I do. I have been putting time of day more. And in your little bag, that's another thing. We took the herp monitoring, a frog and reptile, or a frog <coughs> monitoring class. And they talked about the modified Beaufort scale for land. So that talks about how the wind blows and things. So I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe you can use that. So I had that little card made and laminated for you if you wanted to put that in your notebook. Just anything that, you know, might help you. <coughs> a lot of times I like to put, you know, if it just had rained, we were at Sand Ridge yesterday looking for butterflies, so I wrote, you know, it was 3 p.m., but it had been after a heavy rain. This is Michael. Yes, he remembered his notebook for this time. Usually, if you look at my 3 by 5 notebooks, if you go to the back, You'll see this sort of scratchy-like writing. That's Michael. You cannot read his handwriting. He never carries his notebook. He always forgets it. And so it's like, soup. I have a thought. I need to write it down. So he's always borrowing mine. So that's that picture here. So I promised you we were going to generate words. We're going to do it. As Dylan Thomas says, when I experience anything, I experience it as a thing and a word at the same time. Both equally amazing. Uh, several years ago, we had Champagne Urbana had the privilege of hosting Ted Kuzer. He was the poet laureate from 2004 into 2006. And somebody asked him, Mr. Kuzer, Mr. Kuzer, what does a poet do? And he said, they create an elaboration of language. Wow. How do you do that? Well, to me, I think one way, one way would, be, would be to collect words. We all collect something. And words, they're lightweight. They're portable. They're free. You can toss them around. If you don't like that word, you can throw it away. Here are just a few of my favorite words. I love the way they sound, viscous, tumble, mildew. And I could take that, and I could use most of those words to make a sentence. Such as the scaly snake tumbles across the viscous mildew, leaving a wrinkly, pock-marked trail. It's very descriptive. You get a quick mental picture. Somebody else who had people like words was Jack London. In fact, he had a clothesline strung across his room when he lived in Alaska. Anytime he came across a new word, he'd write that word on a piece of paper and clip it to the clothesline. He'd look up that word, and then his, he would use that word in his writing. So his writings were just sprinkled with these wonderful words, estuary, ptarmigan, borealis, swarthy, indigo. What type of words should you look for or should you collect? Favorites, we all have favorite words. We all have words that portray an image and we all and words that provide possibilities. 
here, you find words. Well, if you look here, words are all over. Uh, I'm a magazine junkie, backpacker. Here, I went through one of my backpacker and I collected all these words that I was able to add then to my word notebook. Just wonderful words from the magazine. And as Mark Twain says, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is like the difference between a lightning and a lightning bug. In other words, field guides. Field guides are your friends. And don't forget the dictionary. It is a marvelous apple tree where words quivered brightly in the in inexhaustible canopy of leaves, words opaque and musical, fertile in the foliage of language. We do a lot of master naturalist trainings, and one of the things people said, what you had to do is like some icebreaker. And one woman said, our family always kept the dictionary by the toilet. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> you know, just another place in the description, right? And remember, the more words you know, the better you'll be able to express yourself and your thoughts. Everybody should have a handout. Um, I gave it to you, and it should be something with a color ticket. And then it also is going to say down for do not worry about that. Right now, everybody should have a colored ticket. If you're yellow, you have an adjective. If you're blue, you have a noun. And if you're green, you have a verb. If you could turn on the lights. I would like for you to get into groups of three. And your goal is to create a memorable sentence using your three-word ticket. I want your sentence to have a noun, an adjective, and a verb. And you'll also notice, I think, one group over here is, I think you might be nouns, you might be another group over here, so you're going to have to get up. And you're going to have to get up and mix and mingle. Okay. And I'll give you five minutes. And you can change the tense on your verb or on screen. Weather. The unsuspecting woman screamed in terror as she came upon the octopus's weather carcass. Oh. <laughs> nice description. Okay. Stand up. Oh, oh cobweb. Whimsical. Explode. Okay. The whimsical cobweb exploded the sunlight as the spider danced in the morning dew. <laughs> Who's next? Lumpy. Donut. Tam. We were in apt anticipation, as were our lumpy taste buds, yearning to vigorously tamp the tempting raisin walnut filled carrot donut. <laughs> <laughs> next? Okay, Tingle, so gnarled, windowsill. As I pull the gnarled knot of poison ivy off the windowsill, my hands begin to tingle. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Betty, Ed, and Jenny. And the words? Plunge. Viscous beaver. The sleek ebony beaver plunges to the depth of the pond to scoop, <laughs> scoop up viscous mud to complete this lodge. I don't think anybody... Did you guys hear? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Next. Back here. Onion. Nibble. Oops, pockmark. The pockmark onion did not invite a nibble. <laughs> <laughs> Fungoid. <laughs> uh, slither. Linoleum. In the abandoned house, the snake slithered across the fungoid wooden sills onto the linoleum, crawling with new tenants, silverfish, cockroaches, and mice, his snake banquet. <laughs> okay, this group here? Uh, Gooey. Slather. Caterpillar. As I picked up the broken piece of gooey milkweed the caterpillar had been eating from, 
it became necessary for me to slather my hands with soap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, back here? Okay. Winnow. Brittle salamander. The spotted salamander winnows delicately over the brittle leaves. 